Hey, this is Mario Quintero from Spotlights, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. And we've got another big one for you this week. We have Riley Breckenridge of Thrice. Thrice just put out The Artist and The Ambulance Revisited last year. Their anniversary tour for that record will continue through Europe this year. And we cover everything, the history of the band, their creative process, the records, their major label experience on Island, the recording process for Artist and the Ambulance, which is really interesting. That's coming up shortly. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Reviews. We need Apple Podcast reviews. I'm on the push to 200. We sit at 176, so we're getting close. Keep them coming. We're almost there. We only need 24 more. If you listen on an iPhone, open up the podcast app, search the new scene, scroll down, hit that five-star button. And if you write a review, I'll read it at the end of the show. Shirts. We have shirts for sale at Death Wish Inc. We've got a long sleeve option. We have a bunch of short sleeve options. Pick one up. It's a great way to support the show. Also, you can always email me at newscenepod at iodinerecords.com. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Join the Iodine Noise Cult. Volume 3 is up now, and if you sign up, you'll get every new Iodine vinyl release this year. If you sign up, you don't just get the records. You get rare, deluxe variants, free shipping, bonus flexies, and hand-numbered obi strips. There's only 50 spots in the Noise Cult, so sign up soon. One Line Drawing will be playing ZBR Fest this May in Chicago. Jerome's Dream have East Coast tour dates coming up in February. Check their page or the Iodine page for a list of dates. I'll be at the St. Vitus gig for sure. And Bucket Full of Teeth, the discography is up right now and available for streaming. Get the vinyl as well. Also, don't forget to support our sponsor, for the month of January. And that sponsor is Death Wish Inc. And here's an update from the label. Modern Life is War. Tribulation Work Songs hits stores on March 22nd. This 12-inch EP features all the tracks from their Tribulation Work Songs EP, plus a bonus remix track. Catch the band with Hot Water Music and Quicksand in New York City on May 11th. Wow, what a gig. Pre-order the record now at deathwishinc.com or deathwishinc.eu. Also, you can follow Deathwish Inc. on Instagram at deathwishinc. Okay, so listen, check back in with me in segment three. We'll do a recap of the conversation with Riley. We'll read a new review. I saw Poison the Well this past weekend. They were in New York City for the You Come Before You anniversary shows. There's a lot to talk about, but first, we are going to speak to Riley Breckenridge of Thrice. Enjoy. All right, we are here now with Riley Breckenridge. Riley, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, Riley, it's very exciting to have you here. You know, Thrice has a very rich history. And there's a lot going on. The Artist and the Ambulance Revisited just came out last year. We've got more tour dates coming up for that tour. There's all kinds of stuff going on, and we're going to cover all of that. But Riley, first I want to ask you, how are you doing today? I'm good. Healthy, as far as I know. Um, Yeah, I can't complain. Family's doing good. Uh, We're rehearsing for this little Europe uh, run that we're going to do with Thrice um, in a bit. 
And yeah, stuff's stuff's pretty good. We're avoiding the the plague that seems to be circulating. Yes, it's back in full force. Have you had COVID yet? Um, I tested positive on a tour we did with Bayside. Um, was that last year? No, year before, I think. Um, but I was asymptomatic and then have not had it um, since then, to my knowledge. Uh, my wife's had it twice. Uh, my kids, one of my kids has had it once. The other one has never popped positive. Wow. So you were asymptomatic. That's like a superpower. Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> who, knows, <laughs> who knows what it's going to do to me long term? But um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel crummy at all, really. Amazing. Yeah, I just got over my second bout last week and it was not fun. And everybody's getting sick again. It's going around. Everyone's getting COVID again, or people are getting the flu. It's 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 out there. It's uh, it's not what you want <laughs> at all. Certainly not. Yeah. Where are you living these days? Uh, I live in Orange County, um, in the city of Orange, specifically. So you got a wife and two kids? I do. How old are the kids? Uh, my son is eight, and my daughter is six, almost seven. Wow. So you've got your hands full probably all the time. I do. Uh, we're kind of coming out of the weeds a little bit. Um, having two youngish kids was definitely a challenge and not anything that anybody warned me about before I had kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're, we're starting to like get out of the weeds now. And like, I can, I have a little bit more free time now. Um, they're in school, they get along they got stuff going on. So, um, you know, in the early days, it was just like, man, I have no time to do anything ever. Yeah. You know, because uh, Thrice was on a hiatus and you got back together around 15 or 16. I would guess your first kid was probably what, one, two around that time? Yeah. So how do you balance the band and the kids? That I mean, that just seems, I can barely balance a band and it's just me with not even a partner. How do you do it with a wife and kids? Uh, one of the things that we did when we got back together after the hiatus was made sure that our schedule was a little bit more manageable. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do really long tours anymore. Um, in the old days, we would be out for like seven or eight weeks at a time. And then we'd be home for a week and then we'd go out again for a month and then we'd come home for two weeks and then we'd go out again for six weeks and it just burnt people out and it was really hard on Dustin and Tepe's families. They have kids that are older than mine. So we made sure that we were going to try to balance the workload with the family time and uh, it's been really easy on our end. I mean, it's hard for me to leave my kids and my wife and it's hard for those guys to leave their families as well, but um, it's, it's more manageable. It doesn't seem like dad's gone all the time now. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And you know, I've had this conversation with a lot of bands. When you're younger, for some reason, the mindset tends to be like, this has to be everything or nothing. Mm -hmm. Like people don't think to take a break or a hiatus or you know, just stop for a while because you can pick it up again. It's like, no, we have to go, go, go until we burn ourselves out and then until we hate each other. And then that's it. But the position that you and the rest of the band are in now, I would imagine is pretty good. You, you, you can probably book the shows you want to book. There's demand. We're older, we're established. Uh, you, you can probably get things done fairly easy. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's been really good post hiatus. I feel like there was kind of this um, unspoken thing where it's like you put out a record every two years, you, yeah. you make the record. So you're fully immersed in creating this thing and recording it. And then as soon as you're done recording and you've got the masters done, get on the road, you promote that record, you tour your ass off for a year and a half or two years. And then as soon as you get back, you start the cycle again. And there's just no time to like, come up for air or even I found like there's no time to appreciate what you're doing. I mean, you're grateful to be doing it, but there's no time to reflect. You don't have any time away from it to look at it and be like, Hey man, this is cool. Or this is what I want to do in the future. Um, and I feel like all of us got a little caught up in that cycle 
and felt like there was no way to come up for air. And I think the hiatus ended up doing that for all of us. And then having the band disappear for three, four years, um, just had time to think about everything and uh, what you what you've done and what you want to do in the future and um, really gain a, an additional appreciation for this gift that we have, which is being creative and traveling and sharing our music with people. Right. Right. I feel like when you're stuck in the every two year album cycle too, maybe you get rushed. Maybe you don't spend as much time on the record as you was as you would like. I know for myself, I tend not to write until I'm struck with inspiration. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a specific feeling. I'll get a concept or I'll, I'll just get a feeling and I'll know this is it. This is the right direction. And then I'll run with it. And I I I, I can force it sometimes, but not all the time. How does it work? with thrice like when where does the uh where does the writing begin how does it begin if we're moving into a new album yeah um we all write individually um i can't speak to how everyone else does it but for me i definitely have to have something floating around in my head and then go chase it because i did in the past um when we were in that every two years we put out a record cycle um you kind of had to constantly be writing. So I would be like on some day, Oh, I'm going to go write today. And then I'd spend hours working on stuff. A lot of it, most of it actually was trash. Um, and you just hope for something to pop up, but that was kind of a symptom of, of that every two years we put out a record thing. Um, I feel like it's much more productive if, I have something in my head that I need to go chase and then I can chase that. Um, so I try to stay away from the today is a writing day because uh, it just it doesn't really work for me that way. Right. I tried to do that the other week. I sat down and I was like, we need a song. I'm writing a song. Mm-hmm. And I slapped it together and we're, it's a month later and I'm like, I'm throwing it out. I hate it. <laughs> it sounds slapped together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then sometimes with stuff like that, you might listen to it after a month of working on it and you're like, okay, this is trash. And then you keep it somewhere and you revisit it later. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Actually, part of this is cool. How can I build on this? Um, so I try not to like completely trash any ideas that I have. Right. Um, and it's always inspiring to go back and and kind of try to rework stuff. But you can tell pretty quickly if it's not going to work. Right. Yeah. You said everyone will write individually. Mm-hmm. What will they write? Does everyone contribute uh, riffs? Does Do individual people work on lyrics? How does it work? Uh, Dustin does 100% of the lyrics. Um, actually, that's not true. Ed's, uh, Ed's contributed a little bit. Um, I've contributed like a concept to him, but he does probably 99% of the the lyric writing. Um, and then musically, everybody has the ability, not only uh, physically, but with technology now, to write on a variety of instruments. So everybody's coming up with riffs. Um, everybody can like program a drum idea if they want. Um, everybody comes up with key parts or textures. Um, so when it comes time to make a record, everybody's kind of got this stockpile of ideas. And then we either all sit together and go through stuff, or we put it into like a big Dropbox file and um, kind of check out what we've got and see how developed ideas are, um, how certain ideas might work with other ideas. Um, but yeah, when it comes time to make a record, there's like this big purging of, of ideas. And then we kind of whittle it down from there. And thrice music becomes thrice because we all kind of tweak everybody else's babies a little bit. Right. And you know, uh, thrice, thrice reminds me kind of, of cave in, in that you experiment with different styles. The core is there, but you'll experiment with different styles, right? There's a lot of material out there and it's all very good. I appreciate that. 
<laughs> and it's all very unique too, because you, you know the, the earlier albums sounded like the earlier albums. The later albums have their own style. There's mm-hmm. some in between, right? And I th- I love bands like that where you can just you can just kind of do whatever you want within the framework of that band, and it's still accepted. It's still exciting. It's still good. And and Thrice has that. So when you're moving into a new album. How do you decide what it's going to be? Do you just hear all the riffs in the Dropbox and you're like, oh, this is going in a, a heavier direction or this is going in a more ethereal direction? Is it is it influenced by, I guess, whatever what everybody is listening to at the time? Like, how, how does it boil down to the record concept? Uh, it's definitely, it's affected by what people are listening to or being inspired by at the time. Um a lot of times we'll get together early on in the process and say, Hey, we want to make a record that is kind of in this sort of vibe, whether it's like heavy or like a more electronic or more band based, like very organic. Um, but at the end of the day, like once we've all got our hands on all these different parts and we've gone through the recording process and the mixing process and all that, it ends up being something pretty different than what we might have hoped at the beginning and not in a bad way it's just part of the part of the adventure um and i think it's just because we're all so involved there's not one person steering this ship saying we're making a heavy record and this is what it's going to be like and this is what you're going to play and this is what you're going to play and the song will be done when i say it's done um (laughs) you know it it's not like um the most efficient way to make records time wise, but, um, thrice records never become thrice records without all of us being involved and kind of tinkering with, with the songs and the ideas and, you know, nobody's ideas are off limits here. So, um, it's been, it's been really fun to see how stuff develops just naturally with the four of us being in a room or the four of us collaborating on something. I like that. That process can be frustrating because it does take a long time. And that's kind of how I work now where I'm working with other people and I want everybody's input and we have to kind of chop things out in person, but it can take a really long time to write songs. And uh, I'm, I'm one instant gratification. I want to move through it quick, but uh, you don't get the best results that way. And my new rule is, okay, we can rip off a song, but it can't sound like the original song when we're done with it. Mm-hmm. So like you mentioned, when uh, when it you know you have an idea and it becomes this other thing, I think when it becomes this other thing, that's the best part because then it's yours. It's like a unique thing. For sure. I think that one of the biggest difficulties we have is like deciding when it's done because yeah. you, you can end, endlessly tweak stuff um, and just trying to figure out when you're going to put a lid on a song and say, yes, it's done. Um, generally, we're all on the same page and can say, yeah, I think I think this is where it needs to be. But, um, you know, sometimes there's people that's like, that will say, oh, it needs to be faster or uh, it's really missing this layer or uh, structural changes need to be made, but, um, for the most part, we're on the same page with that stuff. That's good. That's good. So you joined this band when you were still in high school. Yes. Uh, not me, but the other guys were in high school. I am like four or five years older than the rest of the guys. Ah, so I was kind of trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do with my life, like finishing college and thinking about jobs and and that kind of stuff and the other guys were in high school and um they didn't have a drummer and ed knew that i had played drums in some high school bands and um all of which were terrible but i had a drum kit and i could play drums so uh, he asked me if i would jam with them and i did and we're still here (laughs) (laughs) pretty amazing right it's wild (laughs) Totally wild. Do you ever think about that, that you just, you know, they're like, hey, can you sit in and play drums on these songs? And now, what is it, like 20 plus years later, you have this unbelievable discography and all this stuff to look back on? Yeah, it's insane to me. (laughs) Completely insane. 
Um, I'm <laughs> thankful for it every day. I feel like uh, the best things happen on accident like that. Oh, for sure. I mean, I didn't even start playing drums until I re- hurt myself really bad playing sports. I was all sports, no music. I mean, I listened to music, but I didn't really play any instruments. And uh, I was like dead set on being a professional baseball player. That's like what I wanted to do. That's why I went to the college that I went to. It's something that I was chasing up until um, my early 20s. And um, I ended up blowing out my knee really bad playing football in high school and needed something that was going to fill that physical void that sports usually gave me. So I, yeah. I bought a drum kit and started playing. And I just think like if I hadn't ruined my knee, I wouldn't have played drums and then I wouldn't be here right now. So it's a, a blessing in disguise, I guess. Big time. Yeah. Which knee was injured? Was it your left? Because I'm thinking about like you hitting the uh, kick drum with your right. No, it was my right knee. Ah. Yeah, I jumped up to catch a pass and got hit. Uh it at at, like a little bit above the knee and my knee essentially bent the wrong way. Ooh. And yeah, it tore my ACL and my MCL and, uh, put, it put me on the shelf for sports for better part of nine or 10 months. So I needed something else to do. I first started playing left footed and left handed. And then, uh, once my, my right leg was functional again, I moved to, to playing in a comfortable fashion. How old were you when, when that happened, when you started drumming? Uh, 17. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, to be 17 years old and be like, oh, uh, I need, I need to exert this physical energy some other way. And like actually thinking about that and getting a drum set is pretty, is pretty advanced. I probably would have just laid there for 10 months. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did my fair share, share of laying around though. <laughs> So for drums, are you just self-taught? Uh, for the most part. Um, I took a couple of lessons, like maybe seven or eight years after I started playing, um, but didn't really follow through on that. I don't know what the deal was. I don't know if I was bored by the material or didn't understand the importance of it. Looking back on it now, I'm like, ah, oh, man, I should have just stuck with it. Yeah. But I took a few lessons um, and was just more into playing music with my friends than working on stuff, really. Um, I re- regret it now. Um, and then everything else I've learned since then has been just scouring YouTube and watching drum videos and watching people play uh, on tour. And I did get a a really good uh, like posture and ergonomics lesson from a guy named Dave Elich. Um, I got that like four or five years ago. I've been meaning to go back to see him. But Did you find that that helped you a lot? Yeah, a ton. Um, I had to kind of change my, my posture and ergonomics, uh, when I hurt my back in 2003, I think it was on tour. I had to miss some shows. I had a really bad back problem. What happened? Uh, I don't know exactly. I think it was from skating. And then, uh, we were on tour, we're on warp tour and I tried to, pull my really heavy bag suitcase out of the the bay of the bus at a really odd angle. And I just felt something pop. And then uh, it started to tighten up on me. And then I went to sleep that night and I woke up the next morning and was going to go pee. And I was walking through the bus and my back just seized up and I like fell to my knees and I was just flat on my back for the rest of the, the drive home. Oof. So I ended up missing like two or three shows and having to go to physical therapy and get all this treatment and then struggled through the end of that tour. Um, and then it had, it kind of gave me trouble on and off, but I did a good job of uh, keeping an eye on it and not skating anymore. And 
not lifting things like an idiot. And uh, yeah. Did people give you a hard time for skating on tour? I've seen that where it's like, dude, why are you skateboarding? You're going to break something and we're going to have to cancel all these shows. <laughs> no, no, because Ed and Tepe both skate all the time still to this day on tour. But I was terrible at skating and shouldn't have been doing it anyway and just did something stupid. So no more skating for me. Thrice, uh, pretty original, well, original band in general. But when I first heard Thrice, I had never heard anything like it. That com- I, it's, To me, it sounds like a combination of the California skate punk and metal, which I had not heard in that way before. So, uh, you know, like what was early inspiration in the beginning of the band for you and the rest of the guys, if you're aware of what they were into as well? I mean, that's exactly what we were listening to at the time. A lot of fat records and epitaph records stuff, all the California skate punk stuff. Um, A little bit of East Coast hardcore, a lot of like Iron Maiden, Metallica, um, some Pantera, Sepultura. um, But yeah, that was very, very clearly what our, our influences were. And that's what we were listening to all the time, pretty much. Uh, Illusion of Safety comes out in 2002. Mm -hmm. This came out on Subsidy Records. And that's when I first heard you. I still remember the night my friend showed me the CD for the first time in the car, in his car. And I was like, oh, I've never heard anything like this before. (laughs) (laughs) When that came out, did you... And I live in Pennsylvania, so, you know, word had to have spread pretty quick. Or... I lived in Pennsylvania at the time, so Mm -hmm. word must have been spreading pretty quickly. I mean, did you see things really start to take off after the release of that record? Yeah, for sure. Um, We we had just recently played like our biggest local show ever. Um, We did like a record release thing at this outdoor mall in Costa Mesa, and it was packed and an absolute madhouse. We did like a, a signing at the, I think it was a Tower Record, or maybe it was a Virgin Records there. Um, but yeah, we could tell that that something was happening. And um, when we started touring on that record, we started to get some attention from major labels, which was very odd <laughs> to us. But like we'd sound check and then have to go meet with some label guy and then come back and play our show and then we'd drive to the next city and then we'd do that all over again it was really really strange but cool how many what was the touring cycle like during illusion of safety and the release of that record had you guys already toured nationally had you already been all over what uh, where were you at i think we had done one one u.s tour at that point and it was the uh, Take Action Plea for Peace tour. And it was with Hot Water Music and Alkaline Trio and Cave In. It was, it was like a crazy uh, six or seven band bill. I don't know how we pulled it off, but um, we'd done that. That was like a seven or eight week run. Um, I think we'd been over to Europe once. I don't know. Don't quote me on any of this. But, um, yeah, we'd had a, we'd had like a, a couple tours under our belt at that point. So while touring that record, you're already meeting with major label people. Mm-hmm. How many different labels do you think you talked to during that time? Ooh, upwards of seven or eight, maybe. I don't know. I mean, wow. <laughs> some of them are like really big, really big indie labels. Some of them were like the biggest, big major labels. Did the guy from DreamWorks, did you meet with him and he told you you were going to be the next Nirvana? <laughs> we we definitely got that speech. <laughs> yeah. I, I I just had Jeff Rickley on the show and he, he talked about how they got that speech, but then someone told him he gave that same speech to Jimmy's Chicken Shack. Yeah, we got, <laughs> I think we, we got that one from... I can't remember what the label was called, but the guy's name was Gary Gersh. Yeah, it was him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he gave us that speech. But then, I mean, we were friends with the Thursday guys too. 
and you end up talking to them and they're like, yeah, you know, we met with this guy uh, and he said we were going to be like the next Nirvana or something. And we're like, oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the line. That's the sales pitch. How old are you at that time? Um, I was 27, 26. Okay. Ish. Okay. Mm-hmm. What is your life like at that time? I mean, did you plan to do, like, I know you said you wanted to do sports, mm-hmm. right? And that was your, that was your focus. And then you kind of got into this, mu- wait, let, you know what? Let's back up a second. I just remembered something else I wanted to ask you. Okay. All right. So you have the sports injury, mm-hmm. you start playing drums and then you're playing in bands, but were, were you a music guy before that? Like, were you into punk bands or hardcore bands or metal bands or any of that, anything under that satellite? Um, I was big on hip hop and R and B when I was in grade school and high school, like early high school, and then started to get into more metal, um, Metallica, Sepultura, Pantera, got into Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Rush, not too much punk stuff. The punk stuff came around, um, like I said, Ed, my brother is a skater and we would watch skate videos and the entire soundtrack of these videos was punk and hardcore bands. So we'd find out about like Pennywise and no effects and RKL and Lagwagon and, um, all these bands through these skate videos. And then that bug kind of hit, you know, bad religion and, um, you start buying everything on that has the epitaph logo on it. And you find out about a bunch more bands and then you do that with fat records. And then you do it with this label and that label and the other label. And at the end of the day, you've got a ton of new favorite bands. So you're around 27 while we're touring on illusion of safety and talking to all these major labels. What is your life like at that point? Do you want to do music full time? Is that your focus? Did you think about doing anything else? Like what was going on? No, at that point I was like, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm not very good at, um, I'm not good at multitasking. So if there's something that I want to do or that I feel like I need to do, I have to go full, full blast pretty much. Um, and that's what I did with music. I was just like, this is what I'm going to do. And I would rather try my hardest and fail than to kind of half-ass it and fail and feel like I could have done better or tried harder. Um, so yeah, I was, I was all in. How about your brother? Was he on the same page? Yeah, I think so. I think all four of us were. Did you guys still live together with your parents at that time? Um, I might have moved back in with my folks. I was doing a lot of like, uh, couch surfing yeah. at the time. Um, yeah, I was kind of floating all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> what did your parents think of you guys out there and all this stuff? Uh, when we, when Ed and I first talked to them about it, um, they were a little taken aback by it, but my dad was actually way more supportive than I thought he was going to be. His stepdad was like a notorious whip cracker and very strict. Mm -hmm. So I think he kind of found some joy in um, allowing us to chase a dream. And I mean, never in a million years did I think he'd be like, yeah, you know, if if this is something that you really want to do, you should, you should do it. But um, that was his general vibe (laughs) with that. Which was surprising. That's good. Very straight laced, like lawyer who came from a strict strict family. He was like a military guy too. So he was he was strict in all other facets, but he was supportive. And um, I think they had doubts about it ever working out. But I do remember we played our biggest hometown headlining show ever. I cannot remember the year. Um, but we played the House of Blues in Anaheim and we sold it out and it was nuts. And my folks were there and I think that's when it clicked for them. And it also kind of clicked for me. I was like, maybe this thing has legs. Like maybe I did make a good choice. 
That must have been a great night. Uh, sold out hometown show, House of Blues. That's a big and well-known venue. Your parents there, right? Mm-hmm. It was terrifying, but, but, <laughs> but everything turned out all right in the end. So we know that Thrice ended up on Island Records. Mm-hmm. And we know that only a year later, was it a year later that the artist in the ambulance came out? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so what, did you guys write that quickly or had you already been working on stuff? No, we wrote it very, very quickly. The label was like, you need to keep touring on Illusion. And then as soon as you come off the road, we're, we need a record in like three months. Oh, really? It was insane. Yeah. <laughs> we were not, We were not ready to write. And um, it just felt like a total rush job. I don't know. We had a lot of help. Um, Brian McTurnan, who produced the record, uh, guided us through the whole thing. But um, it was a wake up call. It was like, oh, wow, like this is a different ball game. Like these people aren't messing around and we cannot take our time doing this. So we worked our asses off. Three months is is crazy. What so what happens? Do you get in the studio with Brian and just start throwing riffs out there? I mean, did did you have any songs done ahead of time? How did it work? I think I don't think we had any songs done uh before we started pre-production with Brian. We had a lot of ideas, um, but no fully formed songs. So Brian would fly out here and do pre-production with us and basically sit in the jam room with us and say, that's good. That's not good. Let's see. What if we did this and that? Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was wild. A lot of work, a lot of long days, a lot of travel on his part. Um, but we got it to where it needed to be eventually. How long would you be in the studio all day working on stuff? Are we talking eight hours, 10 hours, 15 hours? Uh, this was just crammed in like little rehearsal spaces. We ended up having to move a bunch because of like noise problems and I don't know, just a uh, lack of availability. We didn't have a lockout. So we were renting space, like a, a daily rent <laughs> rental thing at, a, at little rehearsal studios. Um, but we'd be in there all day, like 10, 12 hours probably. When it starts to come together, do you guys realize that? Are you really happy with what you're hearing? Or is there such a time crunch that you can't even see that at the time? I don't even think that we were thinking about that. <laughs> we're just trying trying to finish this thing, trying to be stoked on what we had. Um, I know that we wanted to do more with it because we, we our influences had started to expand quite a bit and we wanted to be able to have more of those influences show on the record but there really wasn't time for that we needed to like we needed to work with what we had and there wasn't a lot of time to experiment yeah i've read you said around that time you know you were into a cave in jupiter and you got into radiohead kid a was an influence do i have that correct for sure yeah massive influence yeah around that time see i would do all right i was i used to be pretty close-minded musically mm -hmm. and i would do this thing where if something was hyped i would refuse to listen to it because i don't know it, it was just something i did and then six months later I would listen to it. And I, I did that with Radiohead, Kid A, and then I got into Radiohead. I did that with the Mars Volta, the first record. So I, I would I would stamp my feet on the ground and say no, but then, you know, six months later, I would get into it. So yeah, uh, I was getting into... I would, Those were certainly influences for me as well around that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kid A is one of the most important records in my entire life, and Jupiter as well. Yeah. Um, botches, We Are the Romans as well. Oh, yeah. All came out like at that time. Um, so my mind was just e expanding and like, oh my gosh, you can do all these things. Um, and we got to use some of those influences on artists, but I don't think we went as far down those roads as we wanted to. So when you finish the record, are you happy with it? Is the label happy with it? Um, 
I think the label is happy with it. <laughs> I mean, they had a, a single or two. Um, and we were happy. We were happy with what we were able to make. Um, I think it's been documented that we weren't super stoked on the way the record was mixed. Um, but you know, that happens. The label label wants to hire somebody, uh, very established to do a mix and they, um, they have a way of doing things and then they do that to your record. And, um, so you don't have any input on that process? No. Um, Brian was the only one that attended the mix and um, Andy Wallace mixed it. And I don't think that Brian felt like he was in a position to tell Andy Wallace how to mix something. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we got the mixes back and we were like, yeah, you know, if the label's happy and, and Brian's happy, um, I think, I think we're okay with where it's at. What didn't you like about it? Um, I understand why it sounds the way that it does because it was very of the time. Um, but it's, it's a little too polished and, um, compressed for my liking. And this is, I mean, this is me saying this now at the time it it, it made a lot more sense sonically. Um, but when I go back and listen to it now, it's not, that's not what I enjoy listening to when I listen to music. Um, I like a little bit more life in my mixes. Right. Yeah. It just, it's just, just sounds a, a bit sterile for my, my current taste. Was that experience a uh, part of what inspired you guys to do the revisited version of the record? For sure. Yeah. Um, I think we wanted to, pay homage to the most important record in our catalog and um, some other circumstances like Island not really caring at all to do any repress with us or uh, really work with us in any regard. Um, so we wanted, wanted to revisit the record, um, make it sound the way it would sound if we were to play it live now. And, um, we're really happy with how it came out. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It sounds great. And it, you know, it's just, it's cool to hear like, uh, the modern thrice version of the record. So, so Island, I guess they still own the original. They're, they're not going to work with you to do any kind of repress or anything like that. Correct. Ah, so see, yeah. So the, the revisited makes a lot of sense then. Yeah. The, um, I mean, they would license it to, uh, certain people to do like short or or small, uh, small releases of vinyl and stuff like that. But it was really disconnected from what we were doing. Right. Like we didn't really know about a lot of it or if we did, it was just like, Hey, these people are putting out a, a repress. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that uh, labels will buy the rights to a record, right? And they'll they'll just put out a repress, and they won't even talk to the band. Yeah. Well, well bad or um, bad labels will do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then they'll just sell the records, and that's it. Yep. It's and not, you won't even know about it until you see it announced somewhere. <laughs> nope, it's not great, <laughs> but that's the way it works. Yeah, it is the music industry after all. And to be fair, I mean. We didn't uh, we didn't have a smash hit for for Island and um, you know the relationship didn't didn't work out so and and they own the the record so they can do what they want with it but it would be nice in a perfect world if you could be like hey let's do this or that and they would be excited to do it but they've moved on to bigger and better things. And did so a long time ago. The artist in the ambulance, you know, certainly one of your biggest and most well-known records. Isn't it funny that you only had three months to write it? And <laughs> like, this is what comes of it. Like, why does that happen? That that always happens. So like, bands will write a single and they'll be like, yeah, uh, I, I just came to me. I had to write it in one second. Or, oh, we wrote this in the studio. Or uh, there's the famous story of Blink-182 
the label wanted singles for Take Off Your Pants and Jacket, and the band was mad. So they wrote the stupidest, dumbest <laughs> songs they could. And those became like the two biggest songs on the record. Yeah, it's weird. I don't, I don't know. Trying to Trying to figure out how or why things are successful is uh, pretty futile, <laughs> I think. It's not really up to us. No, not at all. And I mean, we've had we've had songs on records where we're like, oh man, I think people are going to dig this and they hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are songs like, um, like uh, Black Honey, for example, which is on the To Be Everywhere is To Be Nowhere. Um, never in a million years did we think that that would be a single. Um, I think it's like even the track listing uh, reflects that. I think it's like the seventh song on the record or something. We're just like, oh, yeah, this is like a cool jam. Um, And it ended up being, I think it's our biggest single uh, in the band's history. Wow. Which is very odd, but super, (laughs) super cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or how many how many times do you hear a band and, and be like, oh man, this is going to be huge, and then oh, no, yeah. nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, back in the day, my girlfriend used to make fun of us because we would say every band is going to be huge, but we re- <laughs> we really thought that because you remember how it was in like two thousand two, two thousand three, like every band was getting signed or blowing up in the scene. You know, you were seeing all these bands on MTV too. It just seemed like everyone was going to be huge, but not everyone was. Yeah. Uh, So for the follow-up, Visu. Mm -hmm. Now that did come out on Island Records, correct? Yes. So how were things with the label at this point? Were we getting along? uh, Did you have any weird meetings with L.A. Reid? (laughs) Jeff told me some uh, amusing stories about uh, his interactions with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So during that time, I'm sure Jeff mentioned it on on his podcast, but um, essentially the entire label that we signed with at Island went to work for like Warner Brothers. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this like big decision that we had made and uh, signed on the dotted line for didn't, that situation didn't exist anymore. So it was a whole new brain trust at Island. And um Thankfully, we had the same a and guy who was great, Rob Stevenson. Um, he fought for us tooth and nail the whole way. Um, but when it came time to make Visu, learning from making the artist in the ambulance, we're like, that was really rushed. Is there any way that we can like take our time doing this? Because we have some stuff that we want to do. We want to expand our sonic palette. Um you know, we need time to experiment and to write. And um, Rob ended up getting us that luxury. They did suggest a bunch of different producers that we should or could work with, who we ended up meeting with. And uh, ultimately, we went with our own pick, uh, which was Steve Osborne, who had worked with like U2 and Doves and uh, Katie Tunstall, very left of center for the scene that we were in at the time, but it was perfect for us because we wanted to do something different and didn't want to get caught up in what was the screamo bubble at the time. And, uh, we ended up working with Steve and, um, it was a really great experience. Like a lot of learning happened and a lot of experimenting and, um, it was super cool. And we made a record that we're very, very proud of. And I think it's a record that um, kind of set us on the course that we have been on for the last almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately, the label didn't understand it, <laughs> which was <laughs> which is not surprising because the only person we had there that was on our side was was Rob. So when he's going to like marketing managers and product managers and all that and saying, well, here's what this band wants to do. They're like, "Ah, I don't get it. They just want singles. Yep. And I mean, we had a single. um, The second single we did play for L.A. Reid in his office, which was a very uncomfortable meeting. Very weird. What happened? Uh, From what I can recall, he... 
he played the song very loud. It was his song, uh, Red Sky. He played it very loud on this fancy sound system that he had in his office. And it's always uncomfortable listening to your own music with people, even oh, when yeah. they're like your friends. Like, I don't even like playing our my, our records for my wife. Yeah, same. I, I like to send it to them and I say, you listen to it if you want to, but when I'm not here. Right, right. Yeah. But sitting there in the same room, uh, just super awkward and... It seemed like he enjoyed it, but I, I don't think he understood what it was, what we were going for. Um, I don't know. And then I ended up reading like Dan Ozzy's book, that book Sellout. Yeah. Where it's, there's uh, in the Thursday chapter, something about like thrice not being good or something like that, that, that LA read or somebody attached to LA read had said, and I'm like, Oh, well, yeah, I understand. Like I got that vibe <laughs> oh. back, back then, but I didn't, yeah. didn't see it in print. Um, but whatever. I mean, we didn't sign, we didn't sign with LA read, you know, <laughs> like, does it hurt reading that even all these years later? Um, Maybe a little, but it would bother me a little bit at least. I, I guess it bugs me, um, but not as much as I thought it would. Maybe I don't know. Like we didn't sign with LA Reed. We didn't sign with that label because we're like, oh man, we want to work with LA Reed and this team from wh- wherever they came from, Arista. Um, we signed with a label that we felt great about, and uh, with. Lior Cohen and Julie Greenwald and people that seemed like they were into what we were doing. Um, and then all of that changed. So, I mean, that they didn't get it or didn't like it. Um, good. It's not really for you <laughs> anyway. Right. Yeah. Did, uh, did LA or anyone at the label want to get you into like one of those songwriting factories and like craft a song for you or try to turn you into a mainstream rock band? Yes. Uh, they, we, so they pitched that? Yeah, for sure. When we were meeting with producers, we definitely went to the the modern rock hit factories. And uh, did you actually listen to any of the songs? Um, oh no, no, no! I'm. You mean like, did they make songs for us? Yeah, like, did they ever present you any? Did you ever hear any? Oh no, no, no. We met with producers and they were like, this is how we do things. And this is what I've done. And, uh, I mean, we were aware of what those people had done and who they'd worked with, but, um, it was very like major label chop shop kind of thing. Like you come in and you play drums here and then Chad chops them up and makes a song for you. And then Tony over here, like has these ideas that he could do this. And we were just like, okay, this meeting is not for us um yeah we need to work with somebody else but we had i want to say two two or three meetings like that and we took the meetings because we felt like it was uh important for us to do so like for the label um Mm -hmm. but we knew that we weren't interested from the jump but, but, yeah. but being there and seeing that and seeing, oh, like we made whatever, the biggest ballad on rock radio uh, last year, like Hoobastank, uh, The Reason. We did that <laughs> and then we made this band have this song and then we made this band with this, like, it was just gross to us. <laughs> Did you ever, you know, back then or now think like, oh, maybe it would have been cool to have The Reason by uh, Thrice or whatever eh, whatever song they were going to like do? I would have felt so yucky about it that I, I don't <laughs> think, I don't know. I feel yeah. I feel really good with the, the choice that we made back then. And it's it felt like the right choice at the time. And I, I know now that it was because I don't, I mean, even if you lived in a mansion now and had Porsches, it's like, <laughs> what what bought that? Like selling your soul a little bit? Yeah, and it, it doesn't last. Like a lot of those bands will be defined by a song or a few songs where, you know, you take a band like Thrice 
in in my opinion, who has a pretty flawless discography, and you do your own thing, and you answer to nobody but yourselves, you write the songs the way you want to write them, and you have your fan base, which is genuine. Yeah. We're lucky to have such a supporting fan base that allows us to to experiment and, and try new things and just do what we do. And um, I think they know that it's coming from like from an honest place and that we're never like playing the game just to play the game. Right. Or like trying to take advantage of some new trend. So when do you leave Island Records and is that difficult? Is there is it like hard to get off the label or is there any trouble there? Uh, yeah, we ended up... After the, the touring cycle for Visu, um, we cooked up this idea to make this um, four EP double album kind of thing uh, based on the the four elements, which was like kryptonite to, the, to a major label. They were like, you want to what? Uh, okay, I guess. Um, and I think they figured... We were we were gonna write twenty four songs. They're like, if they're gonna write twenty four songs, there's got to be a single in there somewhere, and there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we ended up uh, parting ways amicably. Um, they allowed us to have the masters, and then we ended up taking that record to Vagrant. But I mean, we recorded it ourselves. And we recorded it for cheap. We built a, a studio in uh, like a detached garage at Tepe's old house. And we did everything in that little tiny like one car garage. And yeah, there were no no singles on it. So they're like, we can't do anything with this. And we're like, okay, well, you don't need to, but can we please have the record? Can we please have the fruits of our labor? And they said, yeah, you can do it. And that that is also a, also a testament to Rob Stevenson, our A and R guy there, because he fought for that. Yeah, he sounds solid. He was awesome. Did you cook up the four EP idea just to get off the label, or was that part of it? Maybe subliminally. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, no, I mean it just sounded like something fun to do, and um, in the same way that we kind of spread our wings a bit with Visu, we're like, what if we spread them even further? What if we did uh, an all acoustic EP and what if we did a real ethereal EP and a super heavy EP so we can really chase instead of trying to mash all those ideas together like we would for a regular thrice song, like what if we push them in the direction that they already are, but further. Um, so it was more of like an exercise. We talked talked about like maybe doing it as uh like a side project thing. But then at the end of the day, we decided that it should be thrice because it was. Yeah, certainly on Visu, you know, you you and the band got to start incorporating those those elements and those influences that you talked about previously that you didn't have the time to work in on the artist and the ambulance. And, you know, on Visu and the 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 following records, I think, uh, what is it? The Alchemy, uh, the the Element records. Yeah, Alchemy Index. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a shift in sound. Did you did you get a lot of pushback from the audience? Because, you know, a lot of bands uh, grew out of what they were originally doing to some extent and started experimenting with different sounds, some more successfully than others. How did you, how did your fan base react to it? Um, I think we lost a majority of the strident, like, Thrice is a hardcore band or a post-hardcore band people when we made Visu. Because mm -hmm. Artist was definitely the peak of our popularity. And when we put Visu out, there were a lot of people that were like, what the hell is this? Like, why are there keyboards on this thing? And like, what? <laughs> Electronic music and where's all the screaming and uh, that kind of stuff. So we had kind of thinned the herd a little bit at that point. So maybe making Alchemy Index was a little less of a risk than it might have seemed. Um, but the people, I mean, I don't know where 
the Alchemy Index ranks on a lot of people's, a lot of Thrice fans' uh, rankings of Thrice albums would be. But um, I feel like there is something for everyone there. Like if people are bummed that we were not playing heavy, screamy music, there's an entire EP of pretty heavy, screamy music. Um, so, yeah, I don't think we lost too many more fans for doing Alchemy Index. Um, Visu was the big parting of ways. Yeah, because that that was like the beginning of the change in sound. So I'm sure people weren't used to it. But yeah, when I heard uh, the Alchemy Index for the first time, volumes one and two, I was like, this sounds like, this reminds me of like a cave-in record. Mm-hmm. It's got that rock swagger. It's heavy. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, I love it. Oh, thanks, man. It's a, it, cave-in's definitely a huge influence. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, Jupiter kind of showed us that it's okay to do what you want, even if it's different. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, when I, I think I was 18 when that record came out. And at that time, I was pretty judgmental. And I, I couldn't accept the fact that Caven had changed their sound. Mm-hmm. So I, I wasn't into it at first. But I, I, I came around. I came around. But you know what? Even though I wasn't into it, I still had the record. I still listened to it. And then the major label follow up. There were still songs on that I loved. So even though I was uh, stamping my feet and not happy about it, <laughs> I still liked it to some degree. Yeah, I think um, another reason that record speaks to to me a lot is um, we toured with them when they were touring on that record, and even though it's like a drastic departure from "Until Your Heart Stops." Like those songs fucking kick ass live and they're heavy and they're good and they're loud. And they were just, those dudes are amazing. And uh, even though it's a left turn sonically, like shit still rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Like as a 41 year old now, if I listen to cave I start with Jupiter and work my way forward. That's where, that's where I'm at. With right it. on. Yeah. Yeah. The hiatus. The band went on hiatus in 2012? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. 11 or 12. I think we knew we knew about it in 11. I don't think we announced it until 12 or something like that. So what happened? Um, a lot. <laughs> um, we had been really, really going, like I mentioned earlier, like really going, we were stuck in that churn where it was like, put out a record and tour and put out a record and tour and um, Dustin and Teps were having kids and starting families and uh, they were gone a lot. And now I know how hard that is um, on just basic family structure, how hard it is on the wife, um, how hard it is on the kids. Um, And Dustin decided he just needed a break. Um, and I don't think it was, I mean, for me, I was in a much different position. Like I wasn't married, uh, I didn't have any kids. And I was like, wait, what, how, why? Um, and in retrospect, like I totally get it now, (laughs) now that I have kids and, and a family and, um, and I'm appreciative that I did have a break from it because I feel like we needed it um, so that we could reflect a little bit so that we could kind of recalibrate how we did things and how we do things now. Um, And there was a lot of other stuff going on in our personal lives that was not great, like uh, parents passing away and stuff like that. Um, We had a bunch of gear stolen from our storage space. It just seemed like a lot of stuff was going wrong. So, uh, yeah, it it just seemed like it was time to, to give it a break for a bit. And, um, I think in the message that we ended up sharing with people, it was like, this is not goodbye forever. This is just kind of like bye for now. We need some time and space away from this, uh, without the pressure to like get back in the studio and get back on the road. And, uh, yeah. Right. It had been like a decade of straight touring at that point. Yeah. It was a lot. And that takes its toll. Yeah, for sure. What did you do during the hiatus? I mean, you're probably what, early 30s at that point? Are you like, oh man, this band is the only thing I know? 
Yep. The only thing I've been doing, like, what did you do? What were you thinking? Yeah. Um, I teched for some bands. Um, I got a really horrible office job for a year that had me on the brink of like losing my mind <laughs> and losing my future wife, probably. They'll um, do that. Yeah. Just brutal. Um, and it was a real, real left turn from anything that I was interested in or, um, ever been interested in and I just needed work. So I took it and, uh, did that, then got back into quit that job and then got back into teching for a little bit and was pretty lost for, for a while, just trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do. Um, cause when you put all your eggs in one basket, uh, when that basket isn't there anymore, <laughs> uh, yeah, you, it's tough to figure out what to do as a as a thirty year old. So when do you get word that the guys want to get back together? I think it was like no, when was that? November of twenty fifteen or something. Um, Dustin and Tepe were both living up um, near Seattle, and Brand New was playing a show up there. And Dustin and Tepe went to that show and Dustin texted from the show and he was like, Hey, uh, we're at at brand new, uh, super like good seeing these guys and, uh, inspiring. And I think we should make music again or something, something along those lines. And I, that was not a text I expected to ever get really. Um, but I was really stoked. (laughs) (laughs) And then, um, Around Christmas time, uh, the four of us and our significant others like got together for a dinner and talked about like you know the past and the future and what it could be like and um, it was really cool, like a really good moment of coming together. And we kind of laid out the plan for what we wanted to do over the next year or so. How long uh, from that text until you guys are back in the room playing together again? I don't know for sure. Um, I think Dustin ended up moving back down to Orange County. Tepe was still up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, But I think Teps flew down for like a week and we started jamming again. That must have felt good, right? Considering... uh being so lost before and just trying to figure out what to do for sure. But it was also scary. Cause it's like, what if we don't remember how to do this yeah. anymore? Or like, what if we do remember how to do what we used to do, but like the, the spark is gone. The magic is gone. Yeah. Um, thankfully it was like, you know, getting back on a bike. Yeah. I mean, it seems like people were very happy to have you back. And, uh, there was a great response to, to be everywhere is to be nowhere. Yeah, we were stoked. Very thankful. Is the band enough to make ends meet? Because, you know, you said during the hiatus, you're teching and you're working an office job. Like when Thrice gets back together and you get back out there and start playing and you have a record out, is that enough? Or do you have to do other things to make ends meet? Uh, no, thankfully it is It is enough. It's a, it's a full-time job, which is awesome. Because it is unique in that um, it's not a nine to five. So when I'm home from tour, I can be like super dad for my kids. Um, It sucks being gone. um, And they are at an age where like they don't really get it or they do get it, but they don't like it. Uh, They can't, they have trouble dealing with it. So um, it's nice to when I'm home and I'm not having to rehearse for uh, an upcoming tour, like I can really Im- immerse myself in like daddom. Mm. Um, so I'm thankful that we are able to work the amount that we do and have it pay the bills and have it still give me time to, to really focus on my kids um, and my wife, as opposed to, you know, being physically absent and on tour. Right. That's uh, that's great and extremely rare in the world of music. Yeah. Uh, even more so nowadays. I feel like yeah. young bands, there's just not a lot of not a lot of room for uh, for rock bands to like find success to a level where it can be sustainable. Like all the forces that could possibly be against them are against them. It's tough times for sure. Yeah. 
you at least came up in the uh, era where people bought CDs for a while. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, now kids don't know what CDs are. <laughs> No, there'll be some annoying, you know how like cassettes are kind of a thing again? Yeah. Uh, maybe they'll do that with CDs at some point too. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about what we've got coming up. We just put out The Artist in the Ambulance Revisited last year, yes. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we want people to check that out. We want people to buy it. We want people to listen to it. Yes, that would be great. And you've got the UK EU tour coming up this year. Yes, we leave in a little under a month. We've spent basically the last year doing the nostalgia thing, and it's been really fun, and um, the shows are some of the best shows we've had in years, Um, but I think we are also kind of getting to a point where we're like excited for what's next for Thrice. Instead of looking back, we want to start looking forward. So what is next for Thrice? Now, we know we had the excellent Horizons East, which came out in 2021. What will be next? Do we know what the next record is looking like yet? We've got to make a a follow-up for that, um, which we initially thought that we were going to do almost like in a a Kid A amnesiac kind of way, where we record them both at the same time and then drop the follow-up like six or seven months after uh, the first one comes out. But we got through making, uh, I guess... We made all of Horizons East, and then there were like four or five songs that were feeling pretty album-ish to us, but we couldn't see the end of that to make Horizons West. So instead of rushing it and forcing it and sticking to this concept and um, maybe not feeling great about the second half of it, we decided to take our time, and then we did the Artist in the Ambulance uh, Revisited. And then now we're at a place uh, where I think we're ready to move forward with West and start writing and, and recording that. That's exciting. I like that. Yeah, I like that blueprint too, the Kid A uh, amnesiac back-to-back thing too. I remember getting both of those in, I think, 2003 or four, and you know, they're just classics. Yeah. Um, we just didn't want to be like hamstrung by the overarching concept you know unless you can really crank out uh whatever 22 24 songs in one huge session and feel great about all of it uh there's no need to to force it right i can't do that can you guys do that no (laughs) clearly (laughs) clearly we can't um but i think i'm actually really glad that we ended up doing that because um revisiting artists kind of reconnecting with maybe the heavier side of thrice um touring on that revisited album and playing this kind of stuff i think it um i think it'll inform a lot of the writing for the next record i can't say how much but i know it's there um because that's the headspace we've been in for the last year so um i'm stoked i think we're going to end up with a horizons west that it will be a lot different than it would have been had we not gone back and revisited some of the things that uh, we used to like back in the day and and that a lot of our fans still like. Nice. Yeah. I think people are more open to different things now too. We're older, we're not so stuck in this has to be this and that has to be that. And the younger generations seem a little more open, at least than I was back in the day. I could be wrong, but that's, that's my uh, perception of the whole thing. Seems like it. Yeah. I have a great idea. Are you ready for this? Yes. Okay. We hook thrice back up with Brian McTurnan. Ah. Uh, we, we put you in a room for two months and start a timer and see what kind of album comes out of that. We do it again. What do you think? That would be super fun and I would totally be down to do that. I would love to see what comes out of that. McTurnan is a legend in his own right. Yeah, he is. We would absolutely not be the band that we are today without that dude. And yeah. On so many levels. like. Um, as musicians, uh, as people, the bands that he's introduced us to not only just their music, but like physically introduced us to people, um, just all life changing shit. And, uh, he's a great, great dear friend to this day. And, um, certainly one of the most important people in, in my entire life. 
Yeah, yeah. He, uh, I like to say he was the toast of the town at a Furnace Fest when you guys were there and played Ambulance. <laughs> Because like every band I would see, they would shout out Brian McTernan. I'm like, oh yeah, he's recorded like every band here. So yeah, man, he's a legend. <laughs> I saw you have uh, some tour dates with Town Portal. Yes, they're so good. Oh my god, one of my favorite bands on the planet right now. Yeah, because like the first time I heard them, uh, it was like the album with the lava on the cover. Yeah, I think I think track two. It really reminded me of like an instrumental botch song, and I was like. I'm instantly hooked on this. Yeah. It's like somewhere in between uh, Botch and Meshuggah. And then there's this beautiful melodic thread that ties it all together. But it's like, uh, it's melodic, but it's like fucked up in a good way. <laughs> yeah. It's not just straight brutality. They'll, they'll, they'll hit you with some brutality and then they'll do a left turn and put in some more melodic elements. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, they're so good. I cannot wait to watch them. So everybody, we're going to make sure we check out The Artist in the Ambulance Revisited and the whole rest of the discography. I mean, look, if you somehow have not heard Thrice yet, now is the time. Right, Riley? I think so. There are a lot of people that heard us back in 2003 that were like, eh, this is not for me. But there might be something um, more recent that you're into. Yeah, your your discography, There, there's enough variation that there's something for everybody. Yeah. We got painted with a broad brush back in that uh, that era, the artist era. And uh, I think a lot of people still think of us that way, for better or worse. Some music publications, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like who? Do we want to call anybody out right now and uh, um, chastise them for getting things wrong? No. Okay. That's fine. I'll look it up later and do it at the end of the show. No, I'm just kidding. I'm yeah. just kidding. No, but I, I get it. I, I did that kind of stuff a lot back in the day. I would make judgment calls about bands without even listening to them or not even being informed about them. So uh, in later years, I've gone back and listened to like everything. And I, I, I'm just happier that I can uh, appreciate everything everyone is doing right now and not, not be so judgmental. Yeah. And then, and then you can have the opinions that you have, but at least they're informed, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Riley, I just want to say I appreciate you. You know, you've been making a lot of great music over the years that I've been listening to for a long time. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, man. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it. And there you have it, Riley Breckenridge. Excellent, excellent conversation. Great to catch up on the history of the band direct from Riley himself. And funny that they were on Island Records too, because we just had Jeff on the show and he had some encounters with L.A. Reid over at that label and Thrice had some of the same encounters so and some of the same difficulties as well. But look, they're a very eclectic band. Their discography spans a lot of different soundscapes, similar to Caven, like I was telling Riley, and there's something there for everybody. You know, the first album I heard from Thrice that really grabbed me was Beggars. I think that came out in 2009. The song in particular I really enjoyed was Circles. You know, it was a lot different from the Thrice I had heard in the early days, and that really grabbed me, and I kind of circled out from there. So if you haven't heard all of their stuff, definitely go back and check it out. I really enjoy them. I really enjoy everything I've heard. I'm really digging the artist in the ambulance revisited as well. You know, I like the modern take on it because the, what they're doing now with that record, that's where I'm at. I'm not as into the angsty, screamy, pop punk type stuff as I was when I was younger. So I really enjoy the new take on it. You know, it's thrice as we know them now. And I really enjoyed talking to Riley. So thank you so much, Riley, for coming on the show. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? I'm going to tell you, I'm not doing that well because I got over COVID. And then directly after getting over COVID, I got regular sick. And I've had this head cold congestion thing 
I'm sneezing constantly, my head is congested, and now everything is draining out and I'm coughing like a madman. I can't catch a break this year so far. I've been sick almost every day of the year so far. Uh, But as I record this today, Sunday, January 21st is my 42nd birthday. And despite being sick, it has turned out to be a good week. Thursday night, Vadim was in town, Vadim Tavor, who we know is, uh, among many other things, the touring guitarist for Poison the Well. And Poison the Well played three sold-out shows this weekend in New York City. So Thursday night, I went out to eat with uh, Mike Shaw, who we know from this day forward, and our friend John Mariakis. And Vadim was there as well. We went to a vegan restaurant near St. Vitus. And then I went over to catch the gig. And Lamakia, that's John Lamakia of Candiria, he has a solo band. They opened the show and they were great. It was great to see them live. And Mike from Candiria plays bass in the live band arrangement. And he's one of the best bass players out there for sure. So it was great to see Lamakia and then Poison the Well played. And I stayed for most of the set. I was up front and I had a good spot, but I was getting knocked around a lot and I was sick. I didn't want to get spin kicked in the leg or anything like that and have my knee blown out. So I moved to the back and then some guy windmilled and smashed my shoulder. And I was like, ah, the hell with this. So I went in the back and you couldn't really, you know how it is at St. Vitus if you've been there If it's a really sold out gig, which it was, you can't really see if you're all the way in the back. And there was no seats at the bar, so I could watch on the monitor. They pulled all the seats out of there. And I felt really sick, so I left early. And I knew I was going to see them again Saturday. Friday, I laid low. I didn't do anything. I wasn't feeling good. Saturday, Poison the Well played again. And I caught Sky Came Falling, who opened up. I haven't seen them since like 1999, I think. The last time I saw them was in Jeff Rickley's basement. Back in the day in New Brunswick, Jeff Rickley used to do shows in his basement where he was living at the time. And I saw a show, it was Sky Came Falling and For the Love Of, all the way back in 99. And I recognized one of the songs that Sky Came Falling played at this gig Saturday. I recognized the same song that they played all the way back in 1999. And I was like, wow, uh, kind of crazy that I'm sitting here watching this band over 20 years later. So they were awesome. Uh, Indecision played. I don't think I've seen them since they were Most Precious Blood back in 2002, 2003, something like that. So it was great to see them again. And Poison the Well. This time I got to catch the full set from a balcony, far away from getting punched and windmilled and everything else. They sounded fantastic. Great set, played All of You Come Before You with a couple other hits sprinkled in there from Terror from the Red and The Opposite of December. And it's just great to see Vadim up there performing with the band. Everybody was really into it. Sounded great, looked great. Awesome way to celebrate 42 years on this earth, surrounded by friends. Vadim was there, got to say hi to Tom from Indecision, John, my Brother in Rhythm from uh, The Darling Fire was there. Our friend Chuck from formerly of uh, the band The Mad Splatter was there. Haven't seen him in a long time. And Richie, Vadim's brother, was there. You know Richie, he used to mix the show. And he's helped out with editing from time to time. So hanging out with friends, watching good bands. No better way to celebrate my birthday. And uh, now I'm here putting together the podcast for tomorrow. And it's another great episode. So besides being sick, everything is great. So let's check in with the New Scene Community Hour. We've got some new reviews. And listen, thank you everybody who's sending in Apple Podcast reviews. We're at 178 now. We just need to get to 200. And then I'm going to give it a break for a while. So we've got some new reviews here. First one is from Marissa Ann 19 She says, best music podcast. Five stars. Best music podcast out there right now. I like to hear the personal stories from the artists. I also appreciate that it is independent music. Thank you, Marissa. Next one is from Hari Krishna, Hari Rama. 
Good stuff. Five stars. This guy really knows his stuff. Brings me back to the good old days. So many great interviews with some of the best bands from the scene. Keith is always engaging and endearing. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to hear from some of my favorite artists on a much more personal and intimate level. Thank you, Hare Krishna. I appreciate that. And that's it. That's what we've got for this week. I'm keeping it short again because I'm sick again and my voice probably sounds a little weird because I'm sick and I've been coughing and all that stuff. And I'm hoping it's going to be over by next week. I forget what it's like <laughs> to feel normal and to be able to function normally without ta- without taking Advil and Advil cold and sinus and Dayquil and Nyquil and all this other crap. So I'm looking forward to feeling normal again. And look, we're back next week with another excellent episode. I'm going to leave you with my music recommendation for this week. You heard me and Riley talking about the band Town Portal that Thrice is going to be on tour with over in Europe, right? Well, I leave you with Town Portal. The song is Archright. It's from their 2019 record of violence. I'll add thrice and town portal to the new scene 2024 spotify playlist find that playlist on spotify follow it and remember if you're on apple podcasts give me a five-star review we're close to 200 and we're closing the gap there i'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest so thanks everybody for listening and until next time